It is a vital piece of equipment in any serious machine shop. It's the vertical milling machine. Gavin Gear here for makingwithmetal.com and ultimatereloader.com. In this video, what I want to do is give you a guided tour of my vertical milling machine. This is the Precision Matthews PM949 TV. It is a three horsepower, variable speed head, bridge port, semi-clone, and over the last year and a half, I've really gotten to know this machine really well and have completely decked it out and set it up the way I, that I want for gunsmithing, for some of that precision work that I do, for general machining and fabrication, drilling, all of the things that I do on a routine basis with a vertical milling machine. So we're gonna walk through each section of the machine and break it down in detail. Look at levers, knobs, feeds and speeds. We'll talk about some of the materials and construction tolerances. We're going to evaluate the machine for precision. We're going to do some demos, some drilling, some boring, some facing, and milling. Those are some of the common things that I do on the machine. And then I'm going to talk about all of the little tweaks that I've done to this machine. Some storage and organization systems, some tooling, how I've set up my cabinet so that I can have a highly efficient workspace. Let's get to it. So for the tour of the machine, we're going to start at the very top and work our way down. Here on the left hand side of the head, at the very top, we've got the motor. This is a single phase three horsepower motor. It's also available with a three phase three horsepower motor. In both cases, that would go through a 20 amp breaker. Working our way down, we've got the spindle brake. You can actually move this around. I like to just have it point, kind of pointing straight forward. We've got the motor control switch, the power down feed selector lever. We've got six thousandths of an inch per revolution, one and a half thousandths and three thousandths. The overload trip clutch, we've got the engagement lever, all this for the power down feed. The direction control, we've also got a fine down feed control wheel that's included with the mill so that you can very precisely feed the quill in the downward direction. We've got the oil cup for the quill. This is not for any kind of rotation, it's literally just for the quill sliding inside of its machined sleeve and it's gonna use 30 weight oil for that, so it's not whey oil. And then we've got the quill. Let's go around to the right hand side. Here on the right hand side, starting here at the top, we've got the spindle speed control hand wheel. There's two speed ranges for this variable speed head. Straight gearing and back gearing. Back gearing is the low range, which is gonna go down to 60 RPM. And in the high range, we're gonna be able to go all the way up to 4200 RPM. We're going to preserve 100% of the motor's torque because in here you've essentially got two spring-loaded dual sheave pulleys with a essentially like a snowmobile transmission. It's one giant belt, and the the size, the di relative diameter of the pulleys changes, effectively changing the spindle speed. But you've got 100% of the motor torque behind that. So I really like this kind of a system. You can change it on the fly. The back gear control lever is here. Back is low, forward is high. We've got the engagement lever for the power down feed. Engaged on the right, disengaged on the left. And we've got the quill handle here. So when you put this handle down, it's gonna be a little bit like a drill press. You can also uh, reset the location of this, set it to your preference. There's some, some holes there. You can even take the whole thing on. You can see there's a complete set of different indexing positions that you can choose from there. We've got the quill lock here, which we're going to use if we've got the quill down or any time that we're not using the quill handle to feed the quill. We've got a swiveling and tilting head. And there's four bolts on the front that you loosen. This bolt here is going to control your swivel. And you've got three bolts here, and you've got a bolt back here that is going to control the tilt angle of the head. One of the things that's important to do when you set up a milling machine is to tram the head in, where you get the tilt and the swivel dialed in exactly, so that if you have a large diameter cutter on here, the plane of that cutter is coplanar with the plane of the bed. And there's multiple ways to do this. I like to use a rod chucked up and then in a collet 
and dual indicators. And if you set up the indicators correctly, you can actually set your swivel and your tilt uh, so that you know you're dialed in basically in either direction when the indicators read the same value. A little bit tricky to set up, but once you get that uh, handled, it's, uh, it's a pretty good way to go. Okay, so working our way back, we've got the RAM. This RAM can be moved in and out. There's two locks here. All of the locks on this machine have aluminum handles and you can set the engagement position by just pulling and working this spline so that like if I wanted it to engage down there, that's absolutely no problem. So all I need to do is unlock both of those and then we can take a 19 millimeter wrench or socket and work the RAM in and out. And that's nice because it gives us even more positioning options compared to a fixed setup. And if you're familiar with the Bridgeport style machine, these types of adjustments are gonna be very familiar to you. Around the back here, I took the opportunity to install a double gang outlet. And what's nice about that is I can have one power feed for all of the 120 volt appliances on the machine, like my x-axis power feed and my DRO and everything can be plugged into this one spot which is just a lot more elegant when it comes to cord routing. I also put in place this holder for all of the wiring and I zip tied the DRO power feed and scale wiring here and I, I gave everything enough slack so that everything can move over all of the different extensions of each axis over the full range of motion of the machine and have enough slack but where nothing is hanging on the floor. Just a couple details that I've paid attention to and dialed in on this machine to make it uh, more elegant to clean and to use. The column is cast iron. This is a really heavy co uh, column. The machine nets out at about 2,500 pounds for this variable speed model and about 2,350 for the step pulley model. There's an access panel on the back. There's an access panel on the other side. And there's also a coolant sump in the base of the machine if you want to use flood coolant. So let's work our way through the knee, through the saddle, up to the table. So here we are looking at the left hand side of the knee. The knee is a Mehanite casting, just like all the castings on this machine. Mehanite is a specification for cast iron that ensures a level of uniformity and quality and it's optimal for machine shop equipment. We've got a standard knee crank here. This is removable. You can flip this backwards if you want when you're not using the machine to allow a little bit more space around the machine. It's got standard splines for engagement. Moving our way back here, we've got the reservoir and pump for the one-shot lube system. There's two outputs here. One goes up to a manifold on the saddle. The other has a small manifold here that goes into the inner workings of the knee. By pulling the handle, you're gonna lubricate all of the primary working surfaces. The jack screw is lubricated separately. You're gonna use a high pressure grease on that as specified and brush it on something like that. And then behind this, we have the locks. And just like the other ones, these you can, you can pull and re-index so that they're exactly engaging at the point where you like them to engage. So if you're working the knee, you're gonna have these unlocked. And then while you're doing machining, if you're not operating the Z axis, you're gonna lock these down. Working our way around to the front of the knee here, we've got our Y axis crank. So here we can see all of the X, the Y, and the Z controls and easy reach. Obviously with the X axis, you can operate that from either end of the table. Okay, so from the knee working our way up, we've got the saddle. The saddle is the bridge between the knee and the table. The Y axis lock is here. So if we lock that down, it's gonna get pretty stiff and that's gonna increase the rigidity of the machine while we're making precise cuts. On the front of the saddle, we've got the x-axis locks. So over to the right, about like that, is an optimal angle for those. Again, we can adjust exactly where these engage 
And if we don't need the x-axis locked in, we can either leave it just floating above the tightening point or we can flap them to the left so that we get a visual indication of whether they're locked or not. Moving from the saddle up to the table, the table is precision ground on the top. Again, it's a Mehanite casting. You can see the M right here. That's how you can tell it's Mehanite. There's also an M up on the column. The table is nine inches wide by 49 inches long. And I really like that when it comes to a milling machine that you're gonna use for things like gunsmithing, because sometimes I'm drilling barrels or I'm inletting stocks for rifles and you need a lot of table real estate for that. Also, you can leave a milling vise set up and something like a rotary table or a spin index, dividing head. It gives you the room to have more area to clamp around and to leave multiple jigs to set up if that's something that you need to do. I wanted to quickly show you the three axis DRO. That was an option that I added for this machine. I'm planning a separate video, so I'm not gonna go too in depth here, but unlike with a lathe, I feel like a DRO is a necessary piece of equipment. You can get by without one, but it makes your life so much easier. We can do things like zero out X, Y, and Z, and then I'm gonna move the X axis here. You can go a certain distance. If we need to drill a series of holes, for instance, that's incredibly helpful. We can use an edge finder to find an edge and or a corner, and then zero things out. Or if we need to, we can also enter a value. So if we use a half inch edge finder, and we want to call our offset a quarter inch, we could just hit X and then type in 0.25. Now the X axis reads 0.25. Now when we come back to zero, it's truly gonna be at the edge. We can also use this as a calculator. So if we hit Cal and go 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 equals, okay, we have one, great. Now we hit Cal, that goes off and we're back to the DRO mode. So you're gonna to wanna to check the Precision Matthews product page for whichever mill you're looking at. They have some new offerings and different offerings, but this is definitely something that I would consider if you're getting a mill and it's probably worth it to have Precision Matthews install it because the installation of a DRO is a very complicated and time consuming process. If you're mechanically inclined and have the time, definitely consider doing it yourself. Another option I elected for on this machine is an X-axis power feed. This is another thing that is very nice to have. You can get by without it and hand crank, but a power feed is great for two reasons. One, it's gonna get you a nice uniform cut, and second, you've got rapid traverse. So let's go over the controls real quick. This is the AL310S. I noticed on precisionmatthews.com that they've actually got two models that are available right now, a standard duty and a severe duty, and this would translate to a standard duty. So we've got a power switch. We've got the direction control lever. I'm gonna turn the power on. We've got the speed control, which is on the knob here. That's for the actual power feeding. You can pretty precisely control that. And then we've got the rapid. We have to wait for that to stop, and then we can wrap it the other way. And once you put it in the neutral position, you can instantly hand crank. So a really nice thing to add to your machine. So before we go to the demos, I wanna look at a couple quick evaluation criteria. We're gonna look at backlash for the x-axis and the y-axis, and then we're gonna look at spindle runout. And for the backlash, I'm just gonna do a super simple test. We're gonna take the x-axis, lock it down nice and snug, and then I'm gonna come down here to the x-axis handle and look at how much movement I have without starting to move the table. And I would say it's about, you can kind of see that, it's about three thousandths of an inch. I have not adjusted this yet, and there is anti-backlash adjustment nuts for both the X and Y axes. So we could tune this in, but I actually wouldn't do that because it's gonna get a little bit more stiff and it's gonna accelerate wear. On a non-CNC machine, the backlash is not nearly as critical. Let's look at the Y axis. For the Y axis, we're gonna do the same thing. We're just gonna lock down the Y axis lock 
and then very, very gently move the handle, the amount of free play that's present. That's about two thousandths of an inch. So that's good, if not just a little bit on the tight side. For spindle run out, I've got a tenth dial test indicator set up here. This is a Meditoyo dial test indicator where every tick mark on this dial corresponds to one ten thousandth of an inch of needle movement. And I've got this set up so that it's going to run right inside the ground surface of the R8 taper inside the spindle. And what I'm going to do is just move the table along the Y axis until we're dialed to zero. That looks good. I'm just going to move the dial just a touch there. Okay. We will call that zero. We've got the machine in high range at maximum speed. And that means that we can just revolve the spindle here by hand to get an idea of where we're at, where we're at with run out. I'm tr trying to apply equal forces here in all directions so as not to impose any undue deflection of the spindle. So our spindle run out was within spec, which is good. And that means it's time for some machining demos. And I thought I would start with a drilling scenario I've got some mild steel. I've got a one inch diameter silver and Deming twist drill bit and a keyless chuck. The nice thing about this machine is that with an R8 spindle taper, we have the ability to use a wide variety of tooling. We can get really inexpensive tooling. If you're on a budget, you can get really high end tooling, but this would be the most popular spindle taper for a vertical milling machine. And I already had a bunch of R8 tooling, and that means I can just go ahead and use it with this machine. I'm using the wrench that came with the machine. I've got the spindle breakdown. We're just going to need about a quarter turn of actual tightening. Good to go. Now I'm going to just put the drill bit in the keyless chuck to make sure that the flats are properly aligned here. That means we're ready to do some drilling. So now that we're getting down to business, I took off my ring, I've got some safety glasses on, and we're ready to roll. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the machine into low range. Make sure that our chuck is tight here. And in low, forward is forward, reverse is reverse. In high, forward is reverse and reverse is forward. Just like a Bridgeport milling machine, it has to do with how the back gearing works. So we're in low range, we're gonna go forward. We've got correct rotation there. And I think I'm gonna speed things down. Let's go to about somewhere around 300 RPM is probably gonna be a good setting. We get things positioned here. Okay. That looks pretty good. And I can get the drill bit touching and then go ahead and engage the power feed. This is where it'd be nice if we had mist coolant or flood coolant. But at this speed, we should be fine. Just as is. There's our hole. So I swapped out the drill chuck for a boring head. What's nice about the boring head is that we can bore to almost arbitrary diameters. Let's say you had a large bearing raceway that you wanted to press a bearing into. You could very precisely bore that. We can also get a really nice surface finish. So with this, I'm gonna unlock my dovetail on the boring head. We're gonna lower the boring head into the hole now I can precisely control the diameter by adjusting the offset. I'm just gonna do this until I feel it hit. Yeah, right about, right about there. Okay. 
Now I'm going to go an additional, let's say, I don't know, five or eight thousandths, somewhere around there. Lock down the dovetail. It's going to preserve our diameter adjustment. These are very similar boring bars to what, what you'd use on a lathe in here. Okay. Now we can get down close, right about there, engage our power feed, put a little oil on the situation. Okay, so we're all the way through, and if we were really concerned about the quality of the hole, what we can do is retract the boring head. Like so, just towards the middle. Unlock the quill and retract it. That is a hole with really nice surface finish, which we can control the diameter of very precisely, no problem, even when we've got an interrupted cut. This time I've swapped the boring bar for a three inch face mill. This is an AccuSize face mill that uses indexable carbide inserts. This is a really nice tool to have. What we're gonna do is face the top of this aluminum chunk. We're going to get a nice finish on that and then we'll switch over to an end mill and mill a little slot along the top. So I'm going to go back to high range with our speed. We're going to go reverse to go forward and I'm going to increase the speed a little bit and we're going to position this so that we just take off ever so slight cut here. Okay, right there. And a zero Z on the DRO. We'll take an extra maybe like 20 thousandths right in that range. Okay, now we're going to lock Y. We're going to lock Z and we're going to power feed along X. And we're not getting a complete clean surface there. So I'm going to take the Z axis, unlock it. We're going to go up to 35 thousandths. This should be enough for a cleanup cut. We will see shortly. All right. That is a real nice looking finish on there. So I've removed the three inch face mill and I've replaced it with a 3 8 inch double ended solid carbide end mill held in place with an R8 collet. An R8 collet set is a great thing to have with a milling machine like this because you can hold a wide variety of tooling with them and you don't need to go overboard. Something like an eight piece set is gonna be totally adequate. This is a collection of collets I got from grandpa and if you have a three axis DRO, they typically come with an R8 collet rack or tooling rack. You can use them for a wide variety of things, but they're kind of best for tooling. So we've got the end mill installed. We're gonna stay in high range. I'm gonna turn on the machine. Again, we turn it to reverse to go forward in high range. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and increase the spindle speed just a little bit. 
and get positioned for our cut here. And nothing too precise here. I'm just gonna go ahead and kiss the surface again. Again, we're gonna zero out the Z axis. I'm gonna go up, I don't know, about an eighth of an inch or so. Okay, so there we are at 125, two tenths more. Come on now, there we go. Okay, we can lock our Y, lock our Z. We can go ahead and make our cut. Let's go ahead and max out our spindle speed. There we go, 4,200 RPM. Sometimes while we're running, we can vary the spindle speed to get just the right cut. You can listen to what's happening and fine tune things accordingly. Cut, unlock Z, go ahead and drop the table. We've got a nice slot we've cut. So that wraps up our simple machining demos. Just a few ways to show this piece of equipment in action. I did want to show you a couple more things that I've done to fine tune this machine. I already showed you the double gang electrical box here in the back, great way to consolidate power runs. Up here on the top of the ram, I've used the threaded hole that we've got up here for the lifting eye as a mount and a pivot point for this custom tooling rack. This is just made out of three inch by three inch angle iron, and it's a way for me to keep all my most frequently used tools within an arm's reach, which is exactly how I like to run the machine. Next, let me show you my tool chest. So this is a roll around tool chest, same exact one I got from Home Depot that I showed in the PM1440 GT video. These are really great, about $300, $350, somewhere around there. They've got ball bearing glides for the chests and this gives me all the room I need to store extra tooling. Of course, we have a set of parallels, an extra set of parallels, that's for my horizontal milling machine. And then I have all of my end mills, for instance, in this drawer. I've got a lot of extra room that I've yet to use, but you know, there's a spot for everything, everything in its spot. Eventually, I'll put labels on this, <laughs> of course. Got the hold down clamp set, that's definitely an essential piece of gear. And then a Kennedy machinist chest up here where I've got things like micrometers, some extra calipers, and a full drill index on the top because that's a very frequently used piece of gear, extra drills, that kind of thing. Love the fact that I can move this out of the way if I need to, it's just a great way to organize the tooling. So there you have it, a guided tour of the Precision Matthews PM949 TV. If you're interested in getting one of these mills, click on that first link in the video description. I'll also have a link in the video description to a full article write-up where I'll have all the details product specifications, a little bit more data, links to more product pages, and so on and so forth. And make sure you're subscribed with notifications because we've got Fundamentals of Mill 100, 200, 300, and 400 level coming up over the next couple of years. You're not gonna wanna miss any of that. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Hey, if you have feedback on this mill, please leave a comment. If you have additional questions, please leave a comment. Until next time, happy machining.